Last time, we were looking at Madison's Federalist 10. You recall that we looked at definition and division in that. As you went back over it, were you able to see those topics and some others? And what kind of reasoning is used in Federalist 10 primarily? Is it inductive or deductive? If you think about it, what would you judge? Not a particularly easy question, but what would you think? He says, causes of faction, can we do away with them? Can't do away with the causes of faction, how do we deal with them? As you keep on going down that decision tree, what kind of reasoning would you call that if you had to make a decision? Is he deducing things or is he making a lot of observations on something and drawing a conclusion? It's a tough one. Any guesses? Any volunteers? Sam, you want to take a shot at it? Uh, logical reasoning. Right? Yeah, it is logical. Is, there, is it deductive or inductive or can't one say? Uh, deductive. I think it's yeah. probably more deductive. That would be my sense. He's not running an experiment. He's not saying here are a bunch of facts. There is one premise he takes, which is what is implanted in the hearts of all human beings. Remember what he says? What is it that is intrinsic to people? And what is intrinsic to society? Why can't we just wish away the problems of faction? He says we all have uh, inherently different desires and different ways of reasoning, yes. and so we'll always end up in faction. Yes, he says that's in human nature. That's exactly it. And is, do you agree with him? Yes, I think so. It would be kind of a horrible world, too, if we were all exactly the same. And what is it, what is it in society, as a fact, in almost every society, that causes differentiation among people? Yes, differences in property. He calls it property. But what that means is that some people have more than others. And therefore, that sets up factions in all kinds of ways. Whether you think that's just or unjust, whether the laws you think are just or unjust, that inequality tends to set up faction. The inequality may be between groups of people. It may be between regions. It may be between political parties. It may be between genders. There are all kinds of reasons for that inequality. And he says, basically, never seen a society without it. Let's turn, therefore, to Henry and Madison arguing against and for the Constitution. If you got your source book, turn to page 57. This is Mr. Henry's speech on the Federal Constitution. It's near the top. Let's start about three lines, four lines down at the end of that line. Hence it appears that three-fourths three of the states must ultimately agree to any amendments that may be necessary. This is a provision in the Constitution about amending the Constitution and how many states need to approve an amendment. Let us consider the consequences of this. However charita uncharitable it may appear, yet I must express my opinion that the most unworthy characters may get into power and prevent the introduction of amendments. Let us suppose, for the case is supposable, possible, and probable that you happen to deal these powers to unworthy hands. Will they relinquish powers already in their possession or agree to amendments? What topics is he using there? That's all right. I forget the exact name, but like uh, possible future fact? Yes, or probable or future, probable probable future fact. fact. And to some degree, I would say perhaps also cause and effect. Why? Because these individuals are unworthy characters. <laughs> unworthy characters here means they're scoundrels. They're blackguards. They're cheaters. And what is the likely result of putting those kinds of people into office? Well, the likely result is that they're going to want to hold on to power. And then the language very often keys you to what these topics are. Let us suppose, for the case is supposable, possible and probable. Couldn't get clearer than that about probable future fact. There it is. Does anyone want to volunteer a topic that they found in Mr. Henry's address on the Constitution? Just one topic. Give us a page number. This one, page 58. OK, next page. 
Uh, about two thirds of the way down. All um, right. He says this, sir, is the language of democracy that a majority of the community have a right to alter their government when found to be oppressive. I said that was definition. Okay, definition. How about a little farther up on that page? In the middle of all the various modes and forms of government, that is the best which is capable of producing the greatest degree of happiness and safety and is most effectually secured against the danger of maladministration. Again, the language is a giveaway here. What topic is this? Comparison. Yeah, comparison or degree. degree, yes, yes. And degree and comparison are very closely related because whenever you're comparing things of two different degrees, that's degree, but you're comparing them. Yes. Now, he's making a proposition, too. He's saying it's the best, which does it the most. And we run across that in statements like that, government is best, which governs? Least. least, yes, that's the old phrase, that government, whether you agree with it or not. That government is best, which governs least. In other words, it interferes the least with the lives of individuals and their freedom. Another volunteer for another topic here in Henry. Page 59, All right. uh, about middle of the page, he says, did you ever read of any revolution in any nation brought about by the punishment of those in power? So it's uh, like a historical example, it's like testimony? Yes, it is an example, it is a kind of testimony. Now, it's a question. Yeah, it's like a rhetorical question. It is, a, when, what is a rhetorical question? Like you know the answer to it. Yes, he's, you he's expect everyone to agree with the answer. Yeah. The answer seems to be known. And is it true? Did you ever read of any revolution brought about by the punishment of those in power inflicted by those who had no power at all? Historical question. Did you ever read about a revolution in which those who had virtually no power punished those who had a lot of power? No, 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 no. in front of you, yeah. Carl. Yes, yeah. And what one? The French Revolution. Yeah, the French Revolution. Bingo. When's the French Revolution occur, before or after this? After. You have, yes, after. You ever read about any revo revolution before the French Revolution in European or modern history, of which that's true, that was successful? I'm not talking about the Peasants' Revolt. That wasn't entirely successful. I would have to say no. This is why the French Revolution was considered to be one of the most stunning events of the entire modern millennia. Those people who virtually had nothing. Now, it's, that's an exaggeration, because some of them did have something, to be sure. But those who were have-nots revolted against the haves. And what did they do with the haves? Yes, what do you mean by that? They, they, uh, they separated their bodies from their heads. That's very elegantly they gruesome put. about it. They did it with a new invention invented by a man called Guillotine, and that's what they did. The American Revolution a little different. Was the American Revolution led by people who had absolutely nothing? No, 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 no. No, it wasn't. It was led by a mixed group of people, some of whom were very well-to-do. John Hancock was so well-to-do that I understand when he died, he still owed Harvard College a thousand pounds, which he never paid. I think that's right. But he had wealth otherwise. The Adams family, were they poor? No. The signers of the Declaration of Independence, were they indigent? No. They were part of an establishment in the colonies. But when Henry says this, he is saying something that most people would agree with. French Revolution hadn't happened yet. And that stunned the world. It was an entirely new form of revolution in many ways. The American Revolution was new in many ways, too. But the French Revolution was shocking to people in Europe. Later revolutions, could you say, some of them put in power those who had very little over those who had, which, what, what would you cite there? What other revolutions? Russian. Yes, Russian Revolution would be an example. Perhaps the Chinese Revolution would be an example also. Absolutely. But when he says this, oh, okay, uh, another example of a topic in here. What about page 61? New paragraph. The honorable gentleman's observations respecting the people's right of being the agents in the formation of this government are not accurate in my humble conception. 
The distinction between a national government and a confederacy is not sufficiently discerned. What topic is that? Division. F uh, division, yes. National government and confederacy. And what else might it suggest? Not just division. Perhaps like relationship? Yeah, or maybe. Yeah, degree. There, there, if you're not sufficiently discerning between the two, you are confusing the fact that they seem to be so much different in degree that they're different in kind. And what does Henry want? Does he want a confederacy or a strong national central government? He wants a confederacy. Yes. He wants a confederacy. It is not for nothing that when the southern states secede, they call themselves what? the Confederate States of America, because they don't want to have that kind of strong national government, so they say. It is a confederacy. No, you know, the more you look behind some of this language, the more that you see that there is a consistent kind of, you may not agree with it, but a deep, consistent kind of thought behind it. So let's just look at a couple more. Page 63, in the middle almost exactly in the middle, slightly above it, right after that exclamation point. Why then tell us of dangers to terrify us into an adoption of this new form of government? And yet, who knows the dangers that this new system may produce? They are out of the sight of the common people. They cannot foresee latent consequences. I dread the operation of it on the middling and lower classes of people. It is for them I fear the adoption of this system. <coughs> topic? Possible topic here? Again, the language might help you. Olga's smiling. What, you got to get a guess, Olga? Yeah, cause and effect or antecedent and... Consequent, yes, yes. And you say, well, that's kind of obvious. Well, it may be obvious, but the more that you look at many of these speeches, the more that you will repeatedly see these topics used over and over again. It is a form of verbal reasoning. Doesn't mean you'll have to agree with every one of these statements. That's another matter. But they are cast in the form of these topics. So let us proceed a little farther ahead and look at page 68. The Constitution is said to have beautiful features, but they appear to me horribly frightful. What topic would that be? Hmm? Division. Yeah, division or, yeah, contradiction or compar comparison so blatant it's a contradiction. Some people say they're beautiful, but I think they're horrible. Among other deformities, it has an awful squinting it squints toward monarchy. And does not this raise indignation in the breast of every true American? Your president may easily become your king. What topic is in being invoked here? Probable yeah, probable future fact. And how might that occur? Would it occur bang all of a sudden? Or would it occur slowly by degrees? Slowly by degrees. Yeah, probably. Exactly. The encroachment of tyranny. And if it occurred by degrees, and you once had a president, and then you ended up with a monarch, that would be a difference in kind. That would be a change in degree so much it would be a difference in kind. You know, there was a great debate in the early republic about what to call the person who was the chief executive. And George Washington finally said, please call me Mr. President. Yes. Because some people wanted to call the president your Excellency. Even a few of them wanted to call the President Your Majesty. Not that the President was a king or a queen, but that being the top executive, you needed to build up that office in importance. So there was confusion even at the beginning of how to address the President. And Washington, I think, picked Mr. President because that is a term which simply has to do with a group of people and someone presiding over them. That's all. It doesn't invoke any of the awe and shock and respect of inherited privilege that your majesty or even your excellency might. Let's look at Madison. Did anyone pick some topics out of Madison? That's a little farther on. That begins on page... 
77. Did anyone pick any topics out of Madison? Sam, hold up your book. Point it toward the camera. See all that highlighting? That's the thing. Highlighting, marginalia. I'm not going to be one of those people who says, turn in your books at the end of the hour, and I look through and see who's highlighted them, underlined, and made marginal notes. But that's what there should be. So on page 78, about three quarters of the way down, it says, if we go over the whole Which column? Uh, left column, sorry. Okay. If we go over the whole history of ancient and modern republics, we shall find their destruction to have generally resulted from those causes. And it's using a contradiction from past fact to contradict the previous speaker. Yes. And it follows up with an implied future probability about what that would then cause. Yes. And a little farther up from that, since the general civilization of mankind, I believe, there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. That's a contrast, yes. You see how Madison and Henry are both using topics to do this on the same page and on the right-hand column, right in the middle. He talks about a pernicious confederation and then says, in the first case, he asserts that a majority ought to have the power of altering the government when found to be inadequate to the security of public happiness. In the last case, he affirms that even three-fourths of the community have not a right to alter a government, which experience has proved to be subversive of national felicity. What topic is being done here? He's doing one thing and then another. What should we do with those two statements? Yeah, his comparison. And what's the, what's the implication of this comparison? Um, he's yes, his own reasoning, Mr. Henry's reasoning, is not very straight. He says one thing, and then he says the other thing. And on the face of it, it sounds like they're quite different. It's, it sounds like they're quite different. Page 79, right column, near the top. When the gentleman called our recollection to the usual effects of the concession of powers and imputed the loss of liberty generally to open tyranny rather than to what? You remember Henry said there were two causes, either open tyranny or, we talked about this, Seth, you talked about this, you answered this. You may not remember the exact phrase, but what's gonna eat into people's freedoms, either tyranny or Yes, themselves. The licentiousness of the people is the phrase that Henry used. Exactly. And now here's Madison returning to that. And what does this also show about political debate? Because this is a debate. Your opponent makes a point, you make a counterpoint. Your opponent makes another point, you make a counterpoint. And that's the way a lot of political debate goes. And as a result, it can sometimes not mirror, say, the five parts of a, a classical oration. But it can be a point-by-point -point kind of stochastic refutation. What is stochastic? Someone here in the sciences. Philip? Not quite random, necessarily. Could be random, but stochastic? Yeah, Jack? Yeah, back and forth, a kind of more back and forth issue, which could be random, could start off randomly, but very often it has to do with something happening and something else and then something back. So, and that's the way a lot of political debate goes. It's just the way a lot of public policy questions get carried on. You know, you get up and you say something to reply to what your opponent had said last time, and then your opponent gets up and says something to reply to you. And somebody tries to get the last word. Somebody tries to get a zinger or a bumper sticker worthy phrase that closes that debate. Maybe that's not quite logical, but it helps. I remember one time during one of the presidential debates, Ronald Reagan was up in New Hampshire and people were fighting over who was going to get to have the uh, podium, who was going to get to get up there and speak. Because it was being run by a newspaper, this primary debate was being run by a newspaper. And one of the minor party candidates, who maybe had only three or four percent of the possible vote, wanted to be up on the stage. And, well, you think it's a democracy. Maybe that person should. And then Reagan did something which was very interesting. You might not approve of it, but it worked. He got up and said, wait a minute. I paid for this microphone, which turns out technically to have been true. 
That is to say, and he, now in America, when you say, I paid for this, what does that generally mean? 